Hey there, this is John Evans, and welcome back to another episode of Book and Spade. I am here with the eminent and wonderful Catholic apologist, Catholic convert, Steve Ray, and we will be going through uh, a miniature uh, walkthrough of the Holy Land. Many of us can't, uh, currently in the state of New York, where we are at, we're limited in travel, we're limited in space, and we're kind of forced on a digital retreat. So I thought, well, we're kind of compelled into this sort of corner right now because of, you know, the, the way the world is moving. Uh, I thought we might as well travel to the Holy Land with Steve himself. So, Steve, beginning, I'm, I was thinking if you feel comfortable with it, beginning with uh, A Day in the Life of the Holy Family in chronological order, so that we begin in the realm of Nazareth and then make our way step by step by step to Golgotha, if that's all right by you. That's fine. I, I'm, I'm good at dancing, so you lead and I'll follow. Brilliant. All right. So essentially, take us to Nazareth circa what, you know, early first century AD. We are thrust into the dwelling place of the Holy Family. Here's okay. Joseph. Here's Mary. You're stepping back in time to a very rustic way of life. There's no main street going through Nazareth. It's never even mentioned in the Old Testament. Probably only 250 people live in this whole village, built kind of carved into the side of a mountain. They all live in caves. I know that people get the impression that they lived in a house, but the house that they lived in would have been caves. Archaeologists have discovered 25 caves or that people lived in. And um, so they lived in a cave. Now, um, I always like to ask people, first thing in the morning, what do you think the Holy Family did? People always said they prayed. And I like to say, is that the first thing you do first thing in the morning? And they go, well, no, I get up and go to the bathroom. And that is a question that really puts us back into how primitive the life was of the Holy Family. Because if they lived in a cave, there's no running water, there's no electricity, there's no refrigerators, hair uh, dryers, uh, dishwashers, none of this. There's no water. The first thing the fam Holy Family had to do was get up and go use the bathroom, which means going outside the cave. Now, for a while, when I was a boy, we lived in a house that had an outhouse, and I remember what that was like. But this gives you just an idea of how rustic it was. Now, my way of doing this, I, my favorite place to give this talk and meditation is actually in Nazareth when I take my groups there. We uh, stop at the Church of St. Joseph, it's called in Nazareth, and it's built over the cave where the Holy Family actually lived. The Franciscans have a disc there underneath the altar that said Jesus submitted to his parents here. So this is the place that is remembered as the home of Jesus. They, they would be sleeping on mats. I think the roosters would wake them up in the morning. No alarm clocks, no Apple watches, you know, with the uh, ding, ding, ding going off. There would be roosters wake them up. I think Mary's the first one up because her guys are pretty tired and she doesn't want to, she wants to let them sleep as long as they can. So Mary wakes up first. She kicks up the fire going in the fire uh, in the ground there. And there's a, a hole in the, ch um, in the cave for the smoke to go out. And she makes a simple meal. And then she wakes up her guys and they, also go out and use, you know, wherever they have to go to find a place to go to the bathroom. I mean, this is, you know, people say, you can't talk about the Holy Family like that. Well, yes, I can, because they were real people. They lived in a real place, and they had, they, they did not walk three feet above the ground. They walked just like, they lived like we do. And um, I would think they would say their prayers, because the Jews had ritual prayers that they would chant together in the mornings, and then she would send them off to work. And what I've also heard, and you, you know much more about this, uh, in regards to the crafts, craftsmanship of Joseph, uh, would Joseph have set up shop in the cave or adjacent? Would he go to a nearby village like Sepphoris? What does the, the uh, daily work schedule look like for the Holy Family? Well, John, you're pretty sharp there mentioning Sepphoris. Um, you've done some homework here, obviously. The word carpenter, as it's used in the New Testament, is the Greek word tekton, T-E-K-T-O-N, tekton, and it means someone who works with hard materials, wood, stone, metal, whatever. It, it means roughly a guy that has calluses all over his hands, is what a carpenter is. Somebody who's like a day laborer, 
a redneck, a grunt, as we call him. And out in the sun. In Nazareth, they don't have a lot of trees. So it's not likely that wood was the primary source of his work. What they do have is a lot of stone. And even today, when you drive through Nazareth, you see that almost everything is built of stone, called Jerusalem limestone. In fact, all of Jerusalem, there's a law that you have to build out of Jerusalem limestone, the exterior of the building, so there's a uniformity to it. And Nazareth is the same, pretty much. So my way of seeing this is Mary packed them a bag lunch, and she sent them off to work. But where would you go to work if you have only 25 caves? You'd go next door to Josiah and say, hey, Josiah, you got any work? And he'd say, Jesus, come on, man. There's nothing to do here in my cave. I, I had a little project for you last month. But anybody who's in business knows that if you're going to sell your labor, you need a client base. You need someone to, to work for who's going to pay you. Well, I don't think there was a lot of that in Nazareth or anywhere nearby, but about an hour's walk away. And I know it's about an hour's walk away because I've run that distance. I've run from Nazareth to Sepphoris and back again, and probably following the same route they did. And they would get up in the morning, grab their bag lunch that Mary made them, and they would take a hike for about an hour, and they'd arrive at Sepphoris. And there was a big Roman city being built in Sepphoris, and they were drawing skilled and unskilled labor from all over the area to come and work there. And when we take our groups to Sepphoris, we see all the stone. Everything is made of stone. I see Jesus and Joseph either quarrying the stone, chopping the stone, chiseling it out of the rock mountainside, or they were taking the pieces of rock and making them into cubes, because God doesn't make stones this shape. Men do that with hammers and chisels. They didn't have hydraulic equipment. You know, it was all by hand. So they get to work. I think that the union boss handed them a hammer and a chisel, and they pointed to a pile of rocks and said, go over there and get to work. And, and in regards to Mary, what would her schedule look like? And let's say St. Anne is still alive uh, in the early years. What would their work in the house have uh, appeared to be? Well, the first and primary responsibility of the girls would be to get the water. Men do not get water. Men don't carry water. That was a woman's job. And the water source in Nazareth is about a 15-minute walk away. There is no water in Nazareth. There's no well there where you just go out of your cave, get the water, and go back. You'd have to walk 15 minutes to the spring or to well. Today, it's under the Greek Orthodox Church, and you can actually still see the water coming. Have you been there by any chance? By No, I, I, I desire to go one of these days. Oh, I'd love to take you. Uh, there's, there was a spring there, and it's called St. Mary's Well. Even today, it's called that. And they would take a jug on their head, and they would carry it to the well to get the water, fill it up, and bring it back. And that's what they would use during the day, but they would have to go again at night to get another jug of water. You can imagine if you can't turn on the spigot in your kitchen, you, water would be a pretty precious commodity. Now, I always ask the girls when we have our pilgrimages, there's always a few young girls, because a lot of families travel with us. And I ask the girls, do you think, that the girls in Nazareth liked getting up in the morning and walking to the well to get water. And the girls all go, no, we wouldn't like that at all. And I said, I think you're wrong. Who else is at the well? A whole bunch of other young girls. Aha. Uh -huh. So if you don't have Twitter and tweeting and Facebook, who else is at the well? All the other girls. Guess what? You couldn't wait to get up in the morning and go to the well because there you would talk and gossip and chat and discuss everything. And you would then look up at the sky because you didn't have a watch. And you say, oh, no, the sun's getting pretty high. We better get home. Mom's going to be furious. And they'd run back home with their little jugs of water on their head. And that would be Mary's big responsibility every morning and night, along with cleaning the house, making clothes, sewing, fixing, cleaning, cooking, shopping. And you know, interestingly enough, when it comes to eating, they would have a very simple diet. But in the um, Bible, it says that the Jews, although they had very few things they could eat, one of the things they could eat was grasshoppers, crickets, and locusts. And people back then used to eat those grasshoppers because they're high in protein. Also, they could eat sparrows. 
And that's why it says that are not Jesus that are not two sparrows sold for a penny. And I'd always wonder why would anybody want to buy a sparrow? Two sparrows. Well, they ate them back then. They would use a little bit of meat to flavor a big pot of lentil stew or something. So Mary would go out shopping. She'd go out and um, get the food, get the water, come back, clean up the house. And then when everything was ready, she would be waiting for her guys to come home. Jesus and Joseph are out there working all day, blistering hot. I've been there where it's 100 degrees in Nazareth. I've also been there when, it's, when it rained five inches in a day. So this was, uh, they're outside working. They don't look like a lot of the pictures we see of them where they, it looks like they came right from Sweden. These guys were dark skin, dark hair, dark eyes, face dark from burnt sun tan and burn, calloused hands. They were manly men. I like to say that if you came up to Joseph, he could pick you up, John, and throw you over a fence without even trying. That's the kind of manly man he was. They were tough guys. They came home, Mary was waiting for them and she could see them coming over the hilltop and she rushed in, she loved those guys. She got their dinner ready and she got ready to serve them. And then they would have their prayers that night and after dinner and they'd fall asleep, crash on their floor on the, on the mats and they would sleep very hard and tired until the next morning and then they'd start it all over again. Now in regards to worship and uh, on the Sabbath in synagogue, have they excavated a synagogue in and around Nazareth where they have to go to a nearby uh, province? Like close well, it hand? says in, in the Gospels that Jesus stood up one day in Nazareth and spoke in the synagogue. So they must have had a small place of worship. The Greek Catholics have a area that looks like it's underground, and they say that that is the original uh, synagogue from the time of Jesus. Whether it is or not, I don't know. I've come to question whether it is or not since then, but the Bible does say in the Gospels that Jesus stood up and read, and there's also a cliff in Nazareth. Yes, that's right. <laughs> oh, man, why, why I'm such a dunce? I should have remembered Luke. Yes, but they tried to chuck him off. They tried to push him off, and he walked right through him again. So in a small town, here's a guy you can understand it though, John. Here's a guy who's in this small town. He doesn't, he's quiet. He's respectful. He's a nice guy. Probably got good jokes and fun to be with. Always happy. Um, and he just minds his own business. But one day at 30 years old, he stands up and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Yes. Because he anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. And all, all eyes suddenly fix on this uh, little carpenter's or tecton's son uh, looking at them and realizing this man's claiming to be God, yes. Isaiah 61. And well, I think the first thing they said is show us your hands. Those aren't the hands of a, the Messiah, the King of Israel. Those are the hands of a common working grunt. To get, and they think are so angry at him. I mean, it's like say all of a sudden, somebody their little brother stands up and says you know by the way i'm god <laughs> and he, uh, so that was um that was a problem but there there was a synagogue and obviously they were a very devout family and in the house the cave that is the the house of the uh, fa holy family there is a mikveh right as part of that cave which is where they it was a they assumed that was their cave partly because it was a very religious family that went to all the extra work to have their own mikveh for the ceremonial cleansing and washings because the holy family obeyed the law of moses perfectly wow man uh, you know i also heard too that uh, ken dark was excavating above the traditional site of the uh the home of the holy family the cave there and they found glass beads actually uh, i think it, uh, the remains of like a woman's spindle buried in the basically the floor plan of the house i, I think it was as recent as 2005 2006 i don't know if that's valid but if so that would be pretty incredible to stand in the very place where you have the immaculate conception and the son of god literally well you you can do that because um the the immaculate conception took place in nazareth a lot of people think of that as being the birth of jesus in bethlehem nine months later but the real immaculate conception mary. was when mary gave her fiat and said yes and those those tiny little cells in her womb which were too small to see with your human eye 
they were 100% human and 100% divine, God had become flesh. Yeah. And that happened there in, uh, there's another cave, John, that's next to the house of St. Joseph. And that cave is under the church of the Annunciation, the biggest church in the Middle East, the largest basilica. And when you go down in the lower level of that, there's a cave there and there's an altar inside the cave, which is where Mary lived as a girl with Joachim and Anna, where the angel actually met her. That's the cave where he met her under the church of the Annunciation. And on the altar, it says in Latin, the word became flesh here, here, which is really every time I've been there over a hundred times. I've been to Israel, by the way, over 180 times, but I've been in that church at least a hundred or 150 times. And every time it gives me goosebumps to think the word became flesh here. here. Uh, have you ever read quietly to yourself? I know it was not in, um, I know the visitation was nowhere near Nazareth, but have you ever just stood in the Church of the Annunciation? If, if there is a quiet place, I'm sure you have tourists bustling probably through there nonstop, like just the Johannine prologue or, or even the like Luke chapter one, because to stand in the place, just to meditate on what occurred right there, I, I think is the chief distinctive between you know, our, our Christian faith, our Catholic faith, the idea that the word became flesh, that we are not talking about platonic archetypes, that this actually happened on that dirt there. Yep. In my movie on Mary, and I, I, I do have a movie called Mary, Mother of God that I filmed all on location, the uh, producers didn't like it that I said three times. And that happened right here. But I said that three times, but that's you got us there's nothing else like this in human history that god became man they, there's the old saying that uh, facts history and facts are stranger than fiction sometimes and the fact that god came down as a little baby um is incredible and then mary by the way when she found out that she was with child with the angel's message she went to the visitation but that's a hundred miles away she had to walk all that way she didn't just jump on a bus. She had to walk a hundred miles to go visit Elizabeth and then a hundred miles back. And the baby, just as just a little sidelight, it says that she made haste to go visit Elizabeth. So let's say 10 days that she arrived at Elizabeth's house, 10 days after the angel came. And it says that Elizabeth, she said, the mother of my Lord has come to me, and John the Baptist leaps. But even at that point, what a pro-life argument. That yes. child in the womb of Mary, you still could not see it with your naked eye. You would need a microscope to see what was in Mary's womb. And yet Elizabeth recognized that as her Lord. And John the Baptist saw the new Ark of the Covenant with the new word of God in the new Ark of the Covenant, and he leapt for joy even in the mother's womb. Now, one of the things about the Annunciation that I really find interesting and we can learn a lot from it is the last verse of the Annunciation, people ignore this verse. It says, and then the angel left her. Here's a 15-year-old girl standing in the entrance of a cave, probably in bare feet with mud all over her feet. And flies are buzzing around her head because that's what life is like there. And she is standing there holding this jug of water. And the angel just tells her she's going to give birth to the son of God. He's going to sit on the throne of her father, his, her father, David. And how does a 15 year old girl process that message? She's 15 years old. And then the angel left her and the angel didn't come back every day to give her updates. Every day, Mary had to live by faith, not knowing what it was all about, not understanding what. And we know she didn't know everything because when they lost Jesus in Jerusalem and they finally found him three days later, she said, why did you do this, your father? And Mary pondered these things in her heart to Nazareth, all those things she saw. She pondered these things in her heart. And um, so life in the Holy Family in Nazareth was very rustic but I think very personal. And I like to ask people when I'm there, Mary spent her time cleaning, changing Jesus's dirty diapers. Oh, you people don't think of Jesus pooping in his diapers, but he did. They called them nappies in England, but you know, whatever, whatever they used. Um, and then she had to wash those because they didn't have the disposable diapers like we have today. And I'd like to ask people when I'm there, do you, what a waste of time for Mary. 
to be cleaning diapers and going out shopping for food. Mary, this wonderful woman, Jesus and Joseph going to work every day with chisels and hammers. Jesus, just think he could have written a few extra books for the New Testament. There's so many other things he could have done. But for 30 years, he was quiet serving this way. And then I asked the question, what's more spiritual, to pray the rosary or to change a baby's dirty diaper? And people say to pray the rosary. And then I say, well, the baby doesn't think so, nor does Mother Teresa. She Amen. thinks the most spiritual thing you could do right then is to change the diaper and then take the baby with you to pray the rosary. But in other words, the conclusion is the most spiritual thing we can do, learning from the Holy Family, the most spiritual thing we can do at any moment in life is to do exactly what God wants us to do at that moment in life, even if it's changing a diaper or washing dishes. And this leads me just uh, sort of as a bridge between now and the Stations of the Cross. You've stood also uh, in, in the, the remains of the synagogue that is in Capernaum, where finally, you know, the mystery of the Lamb of God, the mystery that begins in Nazareth, that appears finally, his face visible uh, in Bethlehem, the city of bread, the house of bread and the feeding trough for animals where the lambs for the sacrifice in Jerusalem had been gathered, finally stands in Capernaum uh, 30 something years later and says, I am the bread of life come down from heaven. If any man eats my flesh and drinks my blood, he abides in me and I in him and I will raise him up at the last day. And people look at him as they still do the Eucharist and they shake their heads and walk away. What was that like? What is it like taking tours there? And what would you say would have been uh, the experience of the crowd gathered in that meeting hall, including the 12, including, uh, you know, uh, Peter, who basically says to our blessed Lord, in John chapter 6, to whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have come to know and believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Um, I would, when we drive into the, to Capernaum, uh, there's a sign above the gate that says, the Church of the Promise of the Eucharist. John's gospel does not tell us about the institution of the Eucharist in the upper room. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us that story. In John, he gives us the underlying theology, the foundation for the institution, which would take place later. So we enter the church of the promise of the Eucharist. And how did the people then respond? Well, we know how they responded. There were probably 15,000 disciples there that morning waiting for Jesus. Peter's house, we know from archaeology, had a pretty good size. He had a very prominent house, by the way, on the main street, right next to the synagogue and right next to the harbor. And he had a big area in front of his house. And it says that all of these people came uh, who had received the fr uh, free food the day before, the bread, and, the bread and the loaves and the fish. And they all came back for more free food. People love free stuff. And they were all waiting there. And Jesus, after he told them that they had to eat his flesh and drink his blood, they all left. 15,000, probably the number was 15,000 disciples took off across the hills, over the hills uh, to Chorazim and over to Bethsaida and so on, and they left. And Jesus could have called them all back and said, hey, you know, someday the Baptists are going to realize that this was all symbolic, what I'm saying, but uh, so you don't need to leave. It's all just symbolism. And the Baptists will know that someday. But he didn't do that. He let them go. And then he turned to Peter and said, are you going to leave too? And Peter said, I think this is what he actually said, John. I said, Peter says, Lord, we have no idea what you're talking about, eating flesh and drinking blood. But one thing we do know is you're not from around here. You're kind of like a space alien. You've come from heaven, from another place to tell us things we could never know with our own five senses and the gray matter between our ears. We could never figure this all out. And we've learned that if we stay with you long enough, even the hard things that you say, you help us to understand what they mean in time. So we've decided to stay with you because you're the only one that has the words of eternal life. That was their response. Now let me tell you the response of a pilgrim that came with us. We have mass there. Every time we take our groups, we have mass at that, at that synagogue in the house of Peter, above the house of Peter. And in that house of Peter, 
uh, when we are there every Sunday, every day that's there, doesn't matter whether it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whether it's April, May, or June, it's always the same readings. It's the readings of John chapter six of eat my flesh and drink my blood. The sites in the Holy Land, the masses are site specific. They don't follow the year of the church. So when you go to Bethlehem, the mass there is always the birth of Christ. At the Holy Sepulchre, it's always Easter morning mass. And at Capernaum, it's John chapter six. And I always tell people, now when the gospel is finished being read, listen to the last words. The last words come up and it says, and Jesus spoke these words in the synagogue at Capernaum. And all of us turn and we look out the window and there's the synagogue where Jesus said those words. Now a man was with me and he said, I am a reluctant pilgrim. I don't want to really be here on this trip. My wife went fishing with me in Alaska last year. So I promised I'd do whatever she wanted to do this year. So that's why I'm here. My wife said we're going on a Holy Land in exchange for the fishing trip. I said, that's okay. I'm not worried about you. You'll enjoy the trip. When he got done with mass at Capernaum on the third day, he came up to me with tears running down his eyes. And he said, Steve, I'm not a reluctant pilgrim anymore. I just realized where I am. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to Deo Gracias. So, yeah. you know, to, to know that you are there and then to, to make your way from that scene where that, that historical moment, I really should say, where God manifests in the flesh is offering a treatise on, on his own identity, moving to the upper room. You know, I've heard, you know, it's built over the traditional site of the tomb uh, of David, which makes Acts chapter 2 all the more interesting much later on. Uh, you see, men and brethren, that uh, our father David is dead and buried, etc. But, you know, what's unique is what must it be like to begin a walk from the upper room where the Last Supper, the, the institution of the Eucharist, the institution of the Melchizedekian new priesthood is formed, and then making your way in pilgrimage to uh, Gethsemane and the Mount of Olives. That has to be an equally evocative moment, transitioning to, to the Via Della Rosa and really the Via Cruces. There are the two great moments. There is the moment when God becomes man, and then the great moment when God dies, when God, who is man, dies in his human body to carry our sins and goes down to hell to preach the gospel and comes back alive and goes up to heaven. So those are the things. Now, the stations of the cross actually begin in the old city of Jerusalem at the Antonia Fortress. But I take my groups to all those other places as well. And the beginning of the whole passion begins in the upper room on Mount Zion, and it was within the city walls at the time, but it's not anymore. And the tomb of David there, it's a cenotaph, meaning that it's a ceremonial tomb, like you mentioned. It's not the real tomb of Jesus, I mean of uh, David. We don't know exactly where that is today, but he said he was buried in the city of David, which would mean down the hill from the Mount of, uh, uh, of Zion in an area called Sil Silwan of today, which was the city of David then, but they don't know where it was. But in the book of Acts, they did, because Paul Peter says, the tomb of David is here. We all know where he is and his body died, but this son of David did not. His body did not see corruption. So during the time of Pentecost, they still knew where David had been buried. But today the Jews come there, and it's underneath the upper room, and they still pray, and they have a synagogue there, even though it's only a cenotaph, meaning uh, ceremonial, not the real one. So if you're in the upper room and you realize what's going on there, it is a nuptial meal. Jesus is changing the last, the, uh, the Passover meal, the Pash, into something brand new. And we have a problem, John, because there's no lamb mentioned and there's no priest mentioned that night. We don't hear anything about a lamb in the upper room. And you have to eat a lamb at the Passover meal. Nor was there a priest. Oh, but there was a lamb, wasn't there? The lamb was Jesus. He was already the sacrifice. And there's a priest as well. The priest is Jesus. There, he's both the victim and the priest. And when he held up that piece of bread and he said, this is my body, the reason he says it that way is because he is the lamb. 
And we know that from the book of Exodus at the Passover meal, they had to eat the meat of the lamb before they got up and left. So Jesus is saying by that means I am the lamb. This is my body. You have to eat this meat of my flesh before we get up and leave this room, just like the Passover in Exodus. And in fact, at the end of John 14, he even says, let us get up and go from this place, kind of just like Moses in the Exodus. And it's the nuptial meal. It's, it's like a marriage feast. That's, he said, I have longed for this night. Why did he long for it? Because this is the nuptial, the marriage meal. The groom is now giving himself body and blood, soul, and divinity. He's giving his body to the bride, and the bride is receiving the groom into herself. There's this great union taking place, and it's going to bear fruit. There's this nuptial meal, and it's all finalized on the cross. But we still live that nuptial meal, that sacrifice of Christ every day at the Mass. We still have that meal until we get to heaven. It's all a foretaste of the final marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven, which we're going to be the bride, and he's going to give himself all to us again in this beautiful way. So all of this is being pictured in the upper room. Now, the funny thing is I picture myself being in the upper room as Steve Ray the Baptist. You know, I've only been a Catholic 26 years. I used to be an anti-Catholic Baptist. And I, re I think of myself in the upper room saying, well, Lord, you know, I think we have a problem here because we can all see that what you have in your hand is a piece of bread. And that and the goblet over there, that's really, that's wine. That's not your blood. And I think you ought to change your words right now. You said it is your body. I think you ought to change it to say this represents my body. Can you imagine me, Steve Ray, telling Jesus he said it wrong? He said it exactly what he meant, and he meant what he said. And that's why St. Augustine said that when he held that bread in his own hands, he held his own flesh in his own hands. Therefore, we must adore before we eat. That all took place on, right before his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, then he goes down willingly to the Garden of Gethsemane, and there is three places there that I should tell you about. There is a cave called the Grotto of the Arrest. And this is where they would have spent the night because this, you know, it's protected. It's cool in the summer, warm in the winter. They use caves a lot. We already talked about the Holy Family living in a cave. Jesus was born in a cave. In Gethsemane, they would have stayed in a cave because it's a halfway to Jerusalem. But then Jesus got up and walked away from that cave with his three, James, um, Peter, Andrew, and, and John, Peter, James, and John, and they went into the Garden of Gethsemane, which is Gashmaim. It means the oil press is what Gethsemane means. In Hebrew, it's Gashmaim, oil press, where Jesus is now going to be pressed. And he asked them to pray with him. And you can see the trees where he asked them to pray. Some of those trees there, John, are over 2,000 years old. Those trees saw what they saw that night. If they had a mouth and eyes, they could tell you what they saw and heard that night. The same trees. Six of them are over 2,000 years old. And then Jesus walked away over to a stone where he prayed. And that stone now has a big church built over it, the Basilica of, the, of Gethsemane. And we pray around mass. We have mass sitting around that stone where Jesus sweat drops of blood. I think Gethsemane was the most painful part of the passion for Jesus because in a way his crucifixion was very short, only three hours. There's records of Romans keeping men alive on the cross for over a week, hanging there with nails in their hands for over a week. Jesus was only there for three hours, but I think the real pain was in the Garden of Gethsemane when the sins of the world fell on him. And he says, please take this cup from me, but not your will, my will, but yours be done. And at that moment, all of the sins of the world fell on the Son of God. Isaiah 6 says he is holy, holy, holy. The Holy One of God took all of the sins in the world into his human body at that time. Can you imagine the psychological, spiritual, and moral pain? He did not become a sinner. He became a sin bearer. And that had to be the most painful, awful thing. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that starts Gethsemane. He's now arrested, carrying the sins of the world, and they take him back up to Mount Zion, back through the, I can see it all in my mind, back through the Kidron Valley, up to Mount Zion, and there he has a kangaroo court where, Anna, where um, Annas and Caiaphas punch him, and they beat him, and they put him in a prison, and in that, up out there at that site, 
It's called Peter and Galicantu, the church where Peter denied Peter, uh, Jesus, and where Jesus was tried. There's a deep cistern, which is called the prison of the Christ, where he was kept overnight on Holy Thursday before he goes to the Antonia Fortress on Friday morning. And is it true that going down into the the, the holding cell, it, that there's still something of it left, almost the etching of a person crouching? Is that accurate? There is a, you've done your homework, you have. There, there is a, um, I don't know if it's legitimate or not, but a lot of people say it is. I've seen it. And you, it takes a little imagination to picture, to see anything there, but there is a, a darker reddish color to the stone at one point, looking like someone is kneeling. Um, and in that church, in that cistern, we go down the stairs today, but at the time of Christ, cisterns were used to hold water. They had ditches and trenches so that when it rained, the water would be directed and fill, go down into the cistern, which is just a big carved out area underground with only a hole at the top. That's the only way in or out. And it would be filled with water. And so this would be the springtime could be very full of water actually. And when I take my groups there, we go down in that cistern and I read Psalm 88. Yes. yes. Which I think is a, um, if I can get it up here real quick, I'll just read part. Of, well, it says that I am down in the pit. I am close to death. The water encompasses me. My friends have been taken away from me. My only friend is darkness. And you can imagine Jesus being lowered by a rope down into the cistern and just dangling there, or they drop him into the water, or is it just mud? We don't know. But there he spent the night. And what's impressive, John, is that he could have called 72,000 angels. That's 12 legions of angels, the Gospels tell us. And he could have said, okay, that's enough. I'm not going to go through with this. It's way too scary, way too painful. I'm going to call the angels to deliver me but he didn't do it because he loved us so much. He chose to go through with all the upcoming agony. And even more remarkably, you have, as he is, as he is removed, as he's taken essentially to the inner courts, the praetorium in front of Pilate, you have the Messiah, you have God now bearing all the sins of the world, almost as a living icon of Adam. Adam was cursed with the thorns of the earth. This, the last Adam is crowned with thorns. The first Adam forfeits heaven and earth by stretching forth his hand to the lachem of the tree. Instead, now the lachem bears the weight of his own uh, children's sin through the tree of life, which he bears upon his back. I mean, to have been there and to have seen that how one could not have thought, as, as later Shaul of Tarsus will, would meditate on the dichotomy between, you know, the, the last Adam and the son of man, it would be very, very hard not to, to grasp the divine symmetry taking place. But out of curiosity, once our Lord is taken out of basically the, the, the trial, we know that Judas hangs himself. Um, have you visited the potter's field? Is there anything left of the ground? Yes, there's a ch there is actually a church there, not dedicated to him. It's dedicated to a saint that used to have a long beard and long hair, but it's in it's in the valley of of Hinnom, which is hell of today. It's uh, yes. Jesus is called Gehenna, and that is the place where Judas hanged himself. It's also the place where the Israelites, during the time of the kings and the prophets, used to offer children as living sacrifices to the gods Moloch and Chemosh. It's all down. It used to be the, the garbage dump of Jerusalem, which had maggots and fire that never ceased and worms that would never stop. And then Jesus pointed that and said, that's Gehenna. That's what hell is like. Now it's a nice garden. The Jews turned it into a nice garden. But I want to go back to mentioning garden. John is John and his gospel is very smart because he wants to tie. You just tied in the whole Jesus being the last Adam and the tree and all of those parallels. To John wants you to think about the Garden of Eden. So Jesus goes into a garden, which is the Garden of Gethsemane. The rest of it takes place in a garden as well. John tells us that the cross and the tomb were in a garden. You don't think of the, a place of execution being a garden. 
But John wants you to know that it was a garden so that you would think about the Garden of Eden and the parallels taking place. And just in case you miss it, he goes one step further. Who did Mary think Jesus was? In the Gospel of John, she thought he was the gardener. So he wants you to make sure you know that this all took place in a garden. Now, in, you look at the story of Adam and Eve. They were naked in the garden in their innocence because of sins. They were kicked out of the garden clothed. Jesus came into the garden clothed. And to restore our innocence, he was stripped naked. And this is Adam and Eve brought about sin at the tree of life. Jesus brought about life at the tree also, but a tree of death. So the parallels are phenomenal that go on between the Garden of Eden with the new Adam, the old Adam and the old Eve, and the new garden where there's another tree, the cross, and the new Adam and the new Eve being Mary, of course. And the fathers of the church said that Eve tied the knot of sin. But Mary, she untied the knot of sin, which is my, fav my wife's favorite devotion, Mary, the untier of knots. I heard that when you enter the Church of the Holy Sepulchre on the ground floor, there is a, a little known chapel, which I hope one day to go to. And, you know, if you make it there before me, Steve, if you could bring any, if there's any, so, any so much as dust or soil from the ground, <laughs> I could bring back. But it, it's, it's the, the Chapel of Adam. Yes, Bene it's Bene right Bene under Cal, it's right under Golgotha. What is that like? I know it's simple from what I've been told. But Very it, simple. But to know that that's the traditional place where the first man, his bones are greeted with the blood of the last Adam, the, the blood of God. And then right above your... Uh, yeah, yeah, right. I think it's a pious tradition. I don't think that it is literal that that happened. But when you look at icons, you oftentimes see the cross and Jesus on the cross and you see a skull at the base of the cross. And that is to symbolize that the first Adam has died and he was a sinner and it caused physical death represented by the skull. The new Adam has come from heaven to redeem the first Adam and all of mankind so that Jesus as the last Adam is on a tree dripping his blood which drops on the skull of Adam. Now people don't realize that Adam and Eve are considered saints by the church. Yes. Their feast day is December 24th. New Year's Eve is the feast day of Adam and Eve. And there are some great works of art. There's one in what's called the Chorus Choral Church in Istanbul, which was early on in the fourth century. And it has a um, painting on the wall, a fresco of Jesus pulling Adam and Eve up out of the grave. And Eve, her right hand is covered with a red cloth like this. And Jesus is pulling her out with her left hand. She's got this hand covered because she's ashamed that this hand reached out and took the fruit. But Jesus is pulling Adam and Eve up on the resurrection day out of the grave. And the, the chapel there is underneath Calvary. So if you can imagine that you walk in the front door and you turn to the right and there is about 20, 10 feet up is the top of Calvary and you can go up the stairs to it and you can actually reach your hand, John, down under the altar on the top of Calvary. I have all my people come up two by two and reach their hand down under the altar, and you can touch the rock where the cross stood. And I tell people that if you stood there and you touched that rock 2,000 years ago, what you're doing right now, your hand would come up sticky with Jesus's blood. Now, underneath that, there's carved away a chapel very simple altar carved into the rock, and above it is just a very simple icon of Jesus on the cross with Adam's skull at the base of the cross. So after we all go up and touch the top of Calvary, we bring people down and show them the chapel of Adam and explain the symbolism and the meaning of that. Also, it's interesting that up on top of Calvary, there is a mosaic that's probably been there for who knows how long, and it is a mosaic of Abraham offering his son Isaac. Yes. And then you see off to the side a ram stuck in a thorn bush with his head stuck in the thorns. And you realize that God, the Abraham, was offering his only begotten son at the very same place at Mount Moriah, which is Jerusalem. And now another father with his only begotten son 2,000 years later is bringing his son there 
and he's going to offer him. And the ram was his head stuck in a thicket. And like you mentioned earlier, the new lamb, Jesus, is coming up also with a crown of thorns with his head stuck in a thicket. And Isaac went up Mount Moriah carrying the wood of the sacrifice. Jesus, the new Isaac, also carries the wood of the sacrifice up. And there you stand in this little place and you realize all that happened there. A friend of mine named Al Cresta. Yes. I, you know him. He's on Catholic radio. And him and I have been friends since 1983. And finally, two years ago, I was able to take him to the Holy Land, which is hard because he's in a wheelchair. And he got out of his wheelchair, John, and with his stub, his legs cut off above the knee, his left leg. And he crawled on his hands and knees up the steps in great agony. And we found a chair for him up there. And he sat there for an hour looking at Calvary at the top. And he said it was probably the most important hour of his whole life, sitting there looking at the top of Calvary where Jesus had died for his sins. One day I have to go. I have to go. Come with us. I'll show it to you the way Catholics should see it. Amen. We pray every mystery of the rosary at the authentic location. So when you come back, you've prayed every mystery of the rosary where it happened. The empty tomb is a mystery. And whenever I have engaged in debate with a lot of friends of mine, whether they are agnostic or whether they are evangelical Protestants, I point out that the evidence for the resurrection site of Jesus of Nazareth, the son of the living God, the word made flesh, is far stronger than any other alternative candidate, stronger than uh, the original site of the crossing of the Rubicon, stronger than the assassination site of Caesar, because what we know for certain is that at least 300 years later, when Helena would have arrived there, you already would have had a site that every single local Christian would have recognized, covered or uncovered by uh, a Roman temple to Venus, that it was there that essentially the most seminal promise has been given us, that as Christ is bodily raised from the dead, we too will receive the resurrection body at the end of time. What is it like? And of course, just as after a meditation briefly upon that, if before you go, uh, you could explain just what it might have been like uh, to go there for the first time for yourself. Oh boy, uh, you're correct. It is historically reliable. Um, there's a, a General Gordon came from England in the 1800s. He didn't like the Catholic atmosphere of the Holy Sepulchre, so he found an alternative tomb called the Garden Tomb, and that's where the Protestants go, and they claim that that is the place of Golgotha and Calvary and the tomb, which is nonsense, and let's just dismiss it now. The tomb that is there, there is a tomb. It's too old. It's 800 B.C., Exactly. Jesus was placed in a newly hewn tomb. So that's exactly right. The Christians remembered where that was. They put graffiti around it. They always, We think we invented graffiti, but we didn't. They would put all these things around that. And when Emperor Hadrian, in, a, in the beginning of the second century, wanted to obliterate Christianity, so he said, where was Christ crucified and buried? And the Christian said there. So he built, like you said a minute ago, a temple to Venus there to obliterate the Christian site. When Queen Helen came in the 320s, she said to the local Christians, where is it that Jesus was crucified and buried and rose from the dead? And they said, under that pagan temple. And I think she probably said, well, thank you very much, Emperor Hadrian, for marking the spot for us. Now tear it down. And what did they find underneath? They found the, the original tomb with all the graffiti and all of the markings that it was the original tomb. Nobody questions the reality that that is the place where it all happened. And it's been remembered by the local Christians from the very beginning. And for me, what was it like the first time I went? Well, I've been in that tomb now over 200 times easy, and it uh, always is moving. I know that I don't remember exactly, but I know the first time I went to Israel 
and I visited all these sites in the Holy Land. It was 1995 when I got off the plane on the tarmac because it was the old airport back then. Nice modern one now, but it was an old plane. You'd get off the steps and walk across the tarmac. I fell on my face, John, and I wept left a puddle of tears on the black top tarmac because I was in the Holy Land and I couldn't believe it. And I cried every site I went to. I remember one place the priest asked me to do the readings at Mass, actually twice. And I stood up to read them, but I couldn't even get a word out. I started to cry and I had to sit back down and someone else had to do the readings at the Mass. I could not do it. I was too emotional. I even get tears in my eyes thinking about it now. And I remember the going into the Holy Sepulchre the first time. It was so overwhelming that you can't process it. It's like a computer trying to process something far too big, and it's like the hard drive is going chunk, 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 and then it crashes. Because there's just no way that in our finite minds that we can understand and grasp the deeply, profoundly real and spiritual things that took place there that changed all of history and time and reality. I will tell you about my daughter, though, once when I've taken my kids there a lot of time at 15 years old, she went in there. She's almost 30 now with two beautiful kids. But when she was 15, a young teenager, we were there. And she said, while we were in the motel, Dad, I'd like to go over with my friend and pray at the Holy Sepulcher. I said, that's fine. You can go. So she left and walked across the street into this new gate and it's only a 10 minute walk from where we stay at the Notre Dame. And she came back an hour later in tears, threw herself on the bed, just sobbing and in tears. And I thought something bad had happened. I didn't know what. And I said, Emily, you have to tell me what happened. And I had to grab her actually, Emily, tell me what happened. She said, dad, I've been in that tomb with you so many times before. But she said, this time when I was there, I realized Jesus had really been in there. And the Lord revealed himself to my daughter there. She realized the sacramental nature of the fact that God had actually touched that place and been there 2,000 years ago. And those sacramental places, that holy ground reached up and grabbed my daughter and she realized it. And my daughter was never the same. People go in there from our groups and they have tears in their eyes. Almost everyone comes out with tears in their eyes and we get them in after a line. They go in two at a time, four at a time, and they come back out. Their tears, they're just running down their eyes and saying, I, ne I never could have, have experienced anything like that before in my life. And Steve, that, 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 that's, that's why I'm recording this now. This is, this is why, you know, I, I've been inspired by the work you've been doing for that, the patristics your tours all across Europe, because I believe my generation suffers terribly from a platonic, dehistorical view of the Word of God. They, 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 we, have, we have inherited a vague echo, and similar to the prophet Elijah, who after he has confronted the 450 false prophets of Baal, makes his way to Mount Sinai, filled with sorrow in his heart, saying, I alone am left of all the prophets of the children of Israel, on that historic ground where God met the children of Israel and affirmed a living and real covenant. So too, I think God is calling his people right now, those who he is, Ecclesia, who he's called out of the world and into himself to return back as much as possible to the new Sinai. And where is that new Sinai? If I had to find a single place, as beautiful as the uh, Church of the Annunciation would be for where the word becomes flesh, as beautiful as Capernaum or the upper room would be, or even the cross where the blood of God red ran down upon the solid rock, it would be there, there where God is raised bodily and emerges from the tomb triumphant and reveals himself first uh, you know, to Mary Magdalene and the rest of the women as the true gardener of our souls, the gardener of reality. Now, I know we are pressed for time, but very, 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 very briefly, you and I both know this is not the end of the story. 
uh, there is the Mount of the Ascension. And if you would just offer one last note about the Ascension. Sure. That's go. across the Kidron Valley. And Jesus had stood there and wept a few days earlier because the Jews had rejected him. And now he's up there 40 days after the resurrection. He's been all over the land for 40 days. And we visit all those sites. We visit the upper room where he met them twice, the Sea of Galilee where he met them in John 21, Mount of Transfiguration. He went up there because it says, meet me at the mountain in Matthew. And then he says, go out into all the world. That took place on the Mount of Transfiguration also, Mount Tabor in Galilee. But now he's 40 days after the resurrection, he goes up to the Mount of Olives and they still don't understand what's happening, the disciples. They said, are you now going to reconstitute Israel? Are you going to get on a white horse and grab a sword? And we'll all go in and take over Israel and you'll be the king? That's what they're thinking. And he says, all of these things will be made known to you. You just go and pray and, and, and um, pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit. So they went away, by the way, to pray. They prayed for nine days, which is where we get the Catholic novena. Ah! The nine-day prayer came from the upper room. They went and they prayed for nine days, and then on the tenth day, the answer came. But Jesus went up into heaven. He went up, and the, the funny thing is, I like when I'm there, I said, you know, they were, they were not used to Jesus going up. They were always used to him standing on the ground. He'd talk to them, but now all of a sudden, he starts to go up, and they just didn't know quite what to think about that. And the next thing they know, they, they just see the dirty bottom of his feet. And I like to say from, a, from the old uh, Baptist days, Jesus did not turn back around and look down and say, hey, guys, don't forget to read my book. There was no book. What Jesus left was 12 men. And those 12 men went out and taught and practiced. That became the apostolic tradition. Part of that got written down. And 400 years later, it was collected into what we call the New Testament. Jesus started with 12 men, and that's what we have today, the magisterium of the church. So we have um, Jesus going up into heaven. It was a real event. You could have seen it with you were there. You would have seen him go up into heaven and received by the clouds, it says. But if you want to know where did he go, well, you go back to Daniel, the Old Testament prophet Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Daniel says, Behold, I looked and I saw the Son of Man coming in the clouds, and he was presented to the Ancient of Days and given a kingdom which will have no end. Jesus went up into the cloud. Clouds represent the glory of God in the Bible. So he went back from earth up into the glory of God, and he was presented to the Father who gave him a kingdom which will have no end. And I am proud to now be part of that kingdom. Amen. And for all the tempests and for, for good shepherds and bad shepherds, the chair of the shepherd and the chair of the steward still remains. Just then, as the, yes. You said that very well. The church is always there. Jesus is building his church. We've had good shepherds and bad shepherds, and we will continue to have them. Peter denied Jesus. We had the weakest link first. Peter denied Jesus, and he was flip-floppy like a fish oftentimes. But Jesus over took care of his church. And I'm not a Catholic because I like this Pope or that Pope or this Bishop or that Bishop. I'm a Catholic because the church is Jesus's and I'm his brother in the faith. I'm a son of God and I've been baptized into the Catholic church. And that's where I'm going to stay the rest of my life with full joy and anticipation. Amen. Well, Steve, I need to thank you for giving us this gift because frankly, I have longed to walk in the footsteps of the Lord. I have longed to walk in the footsteps of my namesake, John, and to even go to Ephesus and see where his tomb is, yep. and to sit you know, at the Assumption site on, uh, near Gethsemane in the Mount of Olives. And yep. just to know, to know that you've been there and to hear your voice is similar to hearing the voice of one of those <laughs> early apostolic, one of the 72 or one of the 12, so just pray for me, Steve, and just know how grateful we are in every single way. Well, thank you very much. I'm taking a group to the tomb of St. John in October next year. We're going to follow all the footprints of St. Paul through the Mediterranean and Turkey and Greece. I have, we're getting, I have five trips set up to go to the Holy Land next year. And if anybody wants to learn more or take a virtual pilgrimage, go to catholicconvert.com. That's my website. And if you go to my pilgrimage page, 
you can actually, I have two hour videos of every pilgrimage we've done for the last 10 years. You can actually go on a two hour virtual pilgrimage of any of our trips over the last 10 years by going to my website. So catholicconvert.com. John, you're a great guy. I can tell you've done your homework. You care about these things. You know a lot more than most people do. I'm impressed, very impressed. I see all the books behind you and the icons. I can see what you consume your life with. You mentioned the word ecclesia called out. Too many Catholics today are blending and merging back into the world. We have to remember we've been called out of the world to be a unique and peculiar people for God. We can't dabble in the world. We have to be apart from the world, in it, but not part of it. And God bless you for doing that and helping others to do it as well. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much, Steve. And I cannot wait to hear about October. And maybe God willing, I would be most honored to join you. So may Almighty God bless us and keep us. And may his shalom in Yeshua's name be with us. And I am truly, truly eager to hear what happens next. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. All victory. All victory.